From the Preservation Maryland studios in the historic podcast district of Baltimore, this is PreserveCast. We all need role models, and we need to see ourselves represented, whether in film, print, or in Mattel's iconic Barbie. Today's guest is an accomplished historian, author, and participated in a fascinating effort to get the Mattel Corporation to give Barbie a career in architecture. It was a study in representation and the future of the field, a story that we'll detail in miniature and more on this week's PreserveCast. Hey, this is Nick Redding, the host of PreserveCast, and before today's episode, I want to ask you to consider making a quick donation to support the program. PreserveCast is powered by Preservation Maryland, a nonprofit organization, and during difficult times like these, every dollar helps. Your support keeps us on the air, making the case for the value, relevance, and importance of history in our lives, and we all greatly appreciate it. To make a donation, you can visit PreserveCast.org and hit the Donate button in the upper right-hand corner of the page. Thanks for all your help, and keep on preserving. Now, let's get back to the episode. Despina Stratagakis, Vice Provost for Inclusive Excellence at the University of Buffalo, is a writer, historian, and professor. She's the author of three books that explore the intersections of power and architecture. Her most recent book, Where Are the Women Architects?, confronts the challenges women face in the architectural profession. Stratagakis has served as a director of the Society of Architectural Historians, an advisor of the International Archive of Women in Architecture at Virginia Tech, a trustee of the Beverly Willis Architecture Foundation, and deputy director of the Gender Institute at the University at Buffalo. She also participated on Buffalo's Municipal Task Force for Diversity in Architecture and was a founding member of the Architecture and Design Academy, an initiative of the Buffalo Public Schools to encourage design literacy and academic excellence. She received her Ph.D. from Bryn Mawr College and taught at Harvard University and the University of Michigan before joining the Department of Architecture at the University of Buffalo. This is Nick Redding. You're listening to PreserveCast, and today we're joined by Dr. Despina Stratagakos, um, and we are so excited to be talking about the work that she does at the University at Buffalo um, and in her role as the Vice Provost for Inclusive Excellence, as well as her research where and, and some of the studies that she's done confronting the challenges women face in the architectural profession and uh, the lighter side of some of her work in the effort and the fascinating effort to get the Mattel Corporation to give Barbie a career in architecture, which is just a really, really cool story. So I'm um, so glad to have you with us here today. But before we get started, you've had a really fascinating career. I mean, reading your bio is just fun. Um, and it spanned a lot of different disciplines and fields. So where did you grow up and what led you to the work that you do today and, and this, this fun and exciting career that you've had? Um, well, first of all, Nick, thanks so much for, for, um, having me on your podcast. Um, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be talking with a, um, a, an ex, expat um, Buffalonian. Um, and uh, so I grew up in Montreal in Canada at a very turbulent time uh, politically. Um, there was deep social unrest, um, which centered on the Quebec sovereignty uh, movement. And when I was in uh, grade so in 1970, the October crisis uh, erupted uh, when a terrorist group, the FLQ, uh, kidnapped uh, a provincial government minister and a British diplomat, which um, ended up leading to the deployment of the Canadian army um, and the suspension of some civil liberties. Um, so that experience experience uh, was you know terrifying uh, as a child and you know seeing soldiers with, with big guns posted uh, in your your neighborhood and um, at the at the time um, there uh, this was an era when when uh, then Prime Minister Pierre Elliott uh, Trudeau was promoting the idea of multi multiculturalism. So it was um, very confusing in terms of the messages and, you know, wondering whether, you know, as a society, we were going to embrace our differences or whether those were going to tear us apart. Um, and so I grew up in this, you know, in a, in a, at a very intense 
time um, in in Quebec. And um, my parents were were immigrants. Um, they were, you know, trying to adapt to a new uh, country and, and culture. And I would sometimes, uh, you know, act as their translator, you know, both, both linguistically and, and culturally. So I spent a lot of time as a kid trying to figure out cultural uh, boundaries and, and, and being very sensitive to cultural cues about insiders and outsiders. Um, and, uh, so when I look back, I think, okay, maybe that's why I ended up, you know, anthropology and, um, then later on, um, you know, because I loved art, I, I studied art and architectural history, but always through the lens of these frameworks we, we construct to make and understand, uh, uh meaning, uh, um, and, you know, down the road, that's led to my current work looking at the um, inclusions and exclusions of, of academia. Yeah, it's it's and, and speaking of your career, you, you do talk about this this work at the intersection of power and architecture, which I think is so fascinating. Um, and hopefully we can talk a little bit more about that. But that that's taken you everywhere from Adolf Hitler's home to architecture Barbie. Um so maybe um, let's talk a little bit about that. Why is architecture so intertwined with power? Is there something universal you've uncovered in this work or that you found over the course of your study? I think architecture is so powerful because it literally, you know, shapes our, our world and, and our experiences. You know, it creates the physical frameworks, you know, in which, in which we live our lives and, that's true whether we're talking about monumental, ceremonial buildings or, you know, just the humble spaces of, of everyday life. And, and in fact, I think the spaces of everyday life are particularly powerful because we tend not to be as conscious of their effects. And um, in, I think in creating these, these frameworks of, of lived experience, architecture, often reinforces uh, broader ideologies, uh, but it can also be a form of, of resistance to those ideologies. And I think for you know, all of those reasons, you know, we should be paying closer attention to, to architecture's power in, in society. How would you, I'm curious, do you have an example of resistance in architecture? I think that, that might, that's fascinating. I, I, yeah, I do actually. Um, and this might come as a surprise to uh, those who know modern architectural history. So we can take two examples that were built at the same time um, in the early, nine, early to mid 1920s um, of modernist housing. One uh, is an example, I think, that reinforces um, broader ideologies and another that resists. And these two examples are the, uh, the Frankfurt Kitchen, which was designed by Austrian architect Margaret Schilohotsky. Um, it was part of the housing uh, settlements that were created in Frankfurt in the 1920s that were part of the uh, efforts of the Weimar government to um, create through architecture a new society. And so they were very aspirational in terms of the values of uh, everyone having uh, access to good housing and to sunlight and health and to leisure. And so they appear to be, and they were, I, I think in fundamental ways, uh, radical in terms of moving away to, to moving toward a more egalitarian and democratic society. The Frankfurt kitchen, however, um, is, is a little different. Now it was key to these designs because it allowed it, uh, it was this tiny little kitchen that functioned like a hyper efficient machine. And it allowed, because it was so small and so efficient, it, it allowed the architects to uh, create apartments that were smaller, but yet felt spacious, more spacious. And uh, Greta Shlohotsky, as I mentioned, designed the kitchen and it was to be used by a single uh, female user, a housewife. And it was uh, you know, promoted as 
as an advance for women in housekeeping, that it would help the housewife, that it was very modern, and that it treated her as a kind of a professional. But in fact, uh, one of the aims of the the, mod- the kitchen and the modernist housing was to um, and to encourage women to re-domesticate after World War One. So after World War I, um, they were encouraged to, to re-domesticate, to, to leave their, their paid jobs outside the home um, so that returning soldiers could take them. And instead, they were offered what looked like a professional uh, workspace at home. And in fact, what the, the Frankfurt Kitchen ended up doing was allowing women to work both outside the home and inside the home, because many women did continue to work outside the home. So it really doubled in some way their burden. So it looks radical and it looks emancipatory, but in fact, it helped to reinforce uh, gender norms. It helped to reinforce this government um, initiative to re-domesticate women after the war. Okay, same time over in Utrecht in uh, the Netherlands, there is a a young woman, um, Truth Schroeder, who uh, is, is a young widow. Her husband has died and she has three young children and she wants to live a very different life. Her and her, her husband, who was much older, had fought um, about the way that they were raising their children. He was more traditional and conservative. She wanted a different kind of way of being with her kids, being, you know, uh, having a different kind of life. Uh, with them where they were really a part of her life. And so when he dies, she actually takes the opportunity to create uh, a new house. And she uh, works with um, uh, Garrett uh, Riedfeld, a designer, to create the the, uh, Riedfeld Schroeder House, as it's now known in Utrecht, uh, which is uh, reimagines the family, reimagines domestic space, and created uh, in the um, it's a two story building created in the living space, the, which is in the upper floor. This wonderful kind of open space that was meant to bring people together, and and True Schroeder would host artists there and and writers, and the kids were a part of it. And the space was created really to reimagine what what family life would be like. So same period, exactly. Two very different ideas of of, uh, gender norms, of families. um, uh, But both of them, often in architectural history, just treated as two examples of modernist housing without looking at how one uh, reinforces and the other resists um, the gender gender hierarchies. Hmm. So, and and so that. interesting too, because I mean, again, back to your the the statement in the bio about the intersection of power and architecture, both speaking to that as well, whether that be a resisting power or sort of an oppressive power, but but power nonetheless. Um, I, and since I, I since it's strange, I guess, to casually drop Hitler into a conversation, <laughs> um, do you want to give listeners some context on that book and what it explored? A fascinating topic, and I guess you must have been in Germany to do that research. And it sounds like you, you have a real understanding of, of German architecture from, from what you just gave us with the, the Weimar Republic and everything like that. But um, the, the domestic side of Hitler and, and that architecture, what did, what did that look at and what did you find? So I, I did spend two years in Germany uh, researching uh, Hitler at home. And uh, the book is a, a kind of political biography of the dictator's three residences. Uh, so from the 19, from the late 1920s until the mid-1930s, and actually even beyond, Hitler used his domestic spaces to craft a private persona that helped him politically. And this came at a time when he needed to appeal to bourgeois and female voters and to appear less threatening to international governments. And Hitler's PR team created a kind of alter ego of the off-duty dictator who, you know, they 
uh, presented at home, playing with his dogs and neighbors' children uh, as a lover of art and a genial host. And that presentation helped to soften his image and made him seem much more personable. Uh, this happened at a time um, also when there was rapidly growing interest in the private lives of celebrities and politicians, you know, with people wanting to know the real person behind their public uh, facade. So Hitler's PR team um, really expertly manipulated that uh, desire. Um, and then beyond the, the media campaign, I'm also interested in how his domestic spaces were, were architecturally crafted. And Hitler was a very engaged uh, client. Um, and I examined his relationship with Gaudi Trost, uh, the architect who partnered with him on the creation of his homes and also looked more broadly at her role in the Third Reich. Wow. I mean, just really, really fascinating stuff and an interesting, I hadn't really made that connection between the the sort of the personal lives of celebrities, which is now like so ingrained in our culture, right? Like we just want to know everything about how people, you know, how, how they live. <laughs> And this, you know, in the in the twenties and thirties, I mean, it's the, it's the rise of radio and films that um, creates, you know, this new media culture and this hunger to know, you know, to know what the real person is like. And I'm, you know, emphasizing real here because, of course, it's a fiction um, in terms of what people present uh, about their private lives. But it was very powerful because there was this assumption that who you were in your home was the true person, that there was like an honesty and authenticity to it. And Hitler's PR team, they, um, they, they understand that and they use it to uh, shift his image. Yeah, it's interesting and it's terrifying. Um, it is. All at once. <laughs> it is. And it's also another instance of, okay, this uh, admittedly, these are the homes of, you know, an incredibly powerful man. But to me, it, it emphasizes the importance of looking at the spaces of the everyday and understanding how uh, ideologies and politics kind of infuse them. And uh, so even though the his PR team actually argued that politics had nothing to do with Hitler's home, um, of course they were using them uh, politically. And he did a lot of his work actually from home. So it was surprising to me that historians had just ignored these spaces. Right. Yeah, that, that, that fascinating and definitely something people should pick up and, and, and uh, read more about. Um, and you've published a great book great work on that. Um, so they have an opportunity to do that. So let's go back to architecture here in the States for a little bit. Um, you were involved in a fascinating effort um, to get Mattel um, to create uh, and produce an architecture Barbie. So let's talk about that for a minute because it's in and of itself, it's an interesting story, but it's also really illuminating um, just about architecture and gender and um young girls and toys and, and all those sorts of things. So when does the effort begin in, in earnest and maybe then tell us how um, kind of um, leading the story here a little bit, but, but how that first effort fails and then, and then where you go with it. All right. Well, this, this, I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, when you say, when does the effort begin in earnest? Um, I'm like, well, I have to admit it goes way back actually to 2001 okay. when, when uh, Mattel was under pressure from parents to create a, a more positive role model for girls. So it introduced uh, its I Can Be series of career Barbies. And the, uh, the first in the series was a pediatrician, which they called a baby doctor. Um, you know, that's a role <laughs> familiar, presumably, to little girls. And the following year, they held a competition to determine the next career in the series. And they encouraged kids and adults to vote. And you could vote multiple times on Mattel's uh, website. So the choices were architect, librarian, and policewoman. And almost immediately, Immediately, this voting battle broke out between the architect and librarian factions. 
you know, with each side uh, determined to see their their doll win. And uh, this voting war went on for for weeks. And I remember getting, you know, emails from friends and saying, you know, you should vote, you should vote. And at the time I was trying to write a book and I was looking for distractions. And so, you know, I think I voted like 10,000 times um, and, uh, you know, follow this very closely. Mm -hmm. um, and then came right down to the wire. Um, and uh, at, at the very end, uh, architect Barbie surged ahead and, and she won. So that was very exciting, um, but then um, nothing happened. And eventually Mattel released a statement saying they would not produce the doll in the series because architect was too complicated a profession for little girls to understand. You know, it was beyond their comprehension, they said. And, uh, you know, I didn't believe that. And I really saw it as a, a failure of imagination on the part of Mattel. Um, and uh, it was disappointing and frustrating, but there, you know, what can you do? Um, and a few years later, when I was a, a research fellow at the uh, University of Michigan's architecture school, I curated an exhibition that featured architect Barbie and, and asked the architecture students and faculty to design the dolls, um, which, you know, resulted in some very interesting uh, prototypes. And it was, um, the exhibition was a playful way to kind of engage people about gender stereotypes in the, um, in the profession. So then the story goes on. It's a long story. It's like really kind of almost a saga. Um, so in 2010, um, Mattel held another voting campaign to determine the next career in the I Can Be series. And this was the old, this was only the second time they had done that. Um, and again, architect was one of the choices, but now there were five careers in, in total and in, including surgeon and computer scientist. So some really, you know, excellent sort of careers. Now at that point I was living in Buffalo and I teamed up with a friend of mine, Kelly Hayes Macaloni, who is an architect um, to kind of encourage people to vote for architect. And we had a lot of fun with it. Um, but, you know, yet again, uh, architect lost. So um, we thought, okay, you know, what the heck, let's just write to Mattel and tell them, you know, why they really need to produce an architect in the series, why it's, you know, important to introduce girls uh, to architecture. And, and we, we believe that, you know, Barbie had the, the, a special kind of influence. Um, uh, she she has the ability to make things seem natural to little girls. Whatever she does, she brings it into their uh, sphere. And we were really thinking about like the politics of the sandbox. You know, just girls being able to claim this uh, this profession as their own. Um, and you know, we wanted to to harness that power. So so we wrote that. You know, we wrote the letter uh, to Mattel, sent it off, and, you know, never expected uh, to hear from them. Um, but a few months later, they got in touch with us and asked if we were interested in collaborating with them. And so they, they, they start this process, and you guys begin to collaborate. And what does that collaboration look like, and, and what did you learn in the process? Well, it was, um, it was a real learning experience and it took, um, I mean, we, we were working on this for, um, about a year, um, actually. So early on in the process, they pointed out to me and Ke uh, Kelly that designing a doll wasn't about simply taking an image of an adult and miniaturizing it, that it was much more complex than that. Um, we had a lot of discussions about clothes and accessories. Uh, should she wear a dress or slacks? What colors should she wear? Uh, you know, all black clothes, which, you know, many see as iconic of architects, you know, don't translate well to a child, you know, who will see that and think, uh, you know, villain or, or mortician. Um, <laughs> so we get, uh, yeah, I mean, you have to, you know, children have their own aesthetics. And, and um, so we learned about, about that. It was fascinating. Uh, we gave Mattel about 25, a list of about 25 accessories 
um, for an architect and they chose the ones that they felt were, you know, most iconic, for example, uh, a drawing tube, which, you know, they created in bright Barbie pink. So, so they've, they've, they pick out accessories and what is the sort of the final outcome of this? Where do you end with it? And how, how many, you know, did they, they sell it? Did you buy one yourself? What's where, where does it end up? So, um, the- the doll sold out, uh, so presumably the kids liked her. We had the official launch at the um, uh, uh, American Institute of Architects annual convention in uh, New Orleans in 2011, and we uh, we ran workshops uh, for about 400 kids and little girls mostly at the uh, at the convention. So that was really fun because we had a whole uh, big Barbie booth with with you know the Barbie sign and pink hanging you know uh, from the uh, ceiling and people would come by and their their jaws would drop. This was not what they were expecting in the expo hall, um, but it was a lot of fun and it was a, an opportunity to uh, introduce uh, girls to not just to architecture but to the work of women architects who were uh, leading uh, the workshops and talk about what they do and in the context of new orleans in that period we felt it you know incredibly important to to talk about and give people a sense of of agency over their environment so it was a lot of fun uh, running the workshops for the girls in new orleans And the kids, again, really seemed to like her. Um, But there was a whole lot of debate among adults on uh, social media about her, about her dress, the shoes, the accessories, the color pink, her makeup, and about whether Barbie was uh, a regressive cultural icon. And although people were um, arguing about a doll, it seemed to me that it was ultimately about much deeper issues in the profession. And a sharp difference of opinion occurred between different generations of women architecture and what they considered to be empowering as professionals. So a lot of things came up around the doll. It was really interesting. So this is probably a good place for us to take a quick break and um, where we talk about um, our ballot and beyond and give, a, give everyone a suffrage story. And when we come back, maybe we can talk a little bit about sort of the broader implications about this and what this story tells us about architecture, women, and even the future of the profession. And we'll do that right here on PreserveCast. 100 years ago in 1920, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States was signed into law and officially granted 20 million American women the right to vote. This mass expansion in voting rights was the result of generations of intense activism known as the women's suffrage movement that has had a lasting legacy on the continued fight for equality in America. In recognition of the struggles and achievements of a once disenfranchised majority, PreserveCast is honored to share remarkable stories of suffragists within each episode this year. Beyond the Ballot is supported by Preservation Maryland, Gallagher, Avilius, and Jones Attorneys at Law, and the Maryland Historical Trust. To learn more about influential women, past and present, or to donate, please visit BallotAndBeyond.org. This week on Ballot and Beyond, we'll learn about Judge Diana Motz, an advocate for equality and educational opportunities for women. Read by Kimberly Golden Brandt, Director of Smart Growth Maryland at Preservation Maryland. Judge Diana Motz. When President Clinton selected Judge Diana Motz of the Maryland Court of Special Appeals for a seat on the federal appellate bench, one step below the Supreme Court, she thought he had made an error and referred the administration to her husband, Judge J. Frederick Motz, a prominent federal trial judge. There was no mistake. And in 1994, she became the first Maryland woman appointed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. By then, she had years of experience being a pioneer in law. At the University of Virginia School of Law, she was one of just two female students in a class of approximately 250 people. After graduation, she worked at a major law firm where she was the only female attorney. When she argued cases in court, she was routinely the only female in the room amid judges, lawyers, clerks, and court reporters. And she had been just the third woman to serve as a judge on the appellate bench in Maryland. 
As a member of the federal bench, one of Judge Motz's signature opinions arose in a case that dealt with the outright prohibition of women. For more than 150 years, the Virginia Military Institute had offered a premier education dedicated to preparing students for leadership in civilian life and military service. Despite being a public institution that received federal funds, VMI operated as a single sex school for men only. The United States government sued, arguing that the institution's admission policy violated the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. A proposal was offered. A separate but supposedly equal school would be offered to women so VMI could continue as male only. Judge Motz strongly opposed the idea, but she again found herself in the minority. In a dissenting opinion, she wrote, Women need not be guaranteed equal results, but the Equal Protection Clause does require equal opportunity, and that opportunity is being denied here. The case went to the United States Supreme Court, where Judge Motz's reasoning prevailed. The Supreme Court struck down VMI's single-sex policy by a 7-1 to majority, and Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg quoted her multiple times. Judge Diana Motz said, I was in high clover. She remains gratified by the verdict and the role she played in broadening educational and civic opportunities for women. This is Nick Redding. You're listening to Preserve Cast today. We are joined by Dr. Despina Stratagakis, uh, and we've been talking all about um, her work at the intersection of power and architecture, and how that has taken her from the domestic side of Adolf Hitler to uh, architecture Barbie, and the story associated with how um, several um, attempts uh, at getting Mattel to tackle this. Um, failed, but then this outreach effort to this toy company behemoth succeeds and uh, results in getting an architecture Barbie, bringing it to the AAA conference, um, and how there's some disagreement about is this empowering or is this a step back? or And, and really, it, the story, it seems to me, kind of tells a lot about architecture, women, and, and even where the profession is headed. Um, so, I'm curious because there's a whole series of stories of female historians who were drawn to the field by Felicity and other American girl dolls in the 90s and 2000s. And I'm curious if there's anecdotal evidence along those lines for architect Barbie or if the the debate kind of rages on. Like, what is the impact of this, I guess, 10 years on now? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I... I think we're going to, let's see, the girls who were um, in those 2011 workshops and um, buying the doll uh, would be how old now? Um, Well, I guess if they they were 10 then, they're they're going on 20 now, I guess, something like that. To be in architecture school or thinking about architecture school. Um, You know, I... um, I would love to see an architecture school application that mentions architect Barbie as an inspiration. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm sick of hearing about Frank Lloyd Wright and uh, Froebel blocks, uh, but we'll have, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. I think the, the, the bigger influence was just jumpstarting a conversation that needed to happen. And of course these conversations were, were, um, happening, um, for decades beforehand, but I think that architect Barbie gave them a kind of a broader visibility and also, uh, brought a younger generation sort of into the conversation and using the power of social media to, um, um, uh, to advocate for change. And um, I, I see one of the, you know, in terms of, you know, where did this point, um, I do see the this younger activist generation using um, social media in this way as, as one, an indication that of things to come that we, you know, that really exploded around Architect Barbie and that has continued to be really important in terms of how you can use social media um, in, a, in a progressive way. And I think this, the, the other thing that I, I 
the other direction um, that I think emerged from from that story is just the the need to uh, embrace diversity and not just gender identity and expression, but also you know race, sexuality, age, and class, among other individual differences, and how we craft the profession's image of the practitioner. And, you know, what is that image today? I think people are still struggling with it, but I think they understand that it has to change and that the traditional uh, image of the practitioner just isn't adequate um, for the, you know, where the field wants to be and its diversity today. Yeah. And it's a, that's obviously a, a struggle universally across a lot of different fields and certainly in the preservation field as well. Mm-hmm. Um, which I guess, you know, speaking of inclusivity, um, is a nice transition to something else I wanted to ask you about, which is, you know, you're currently serving as the vice provost, um, for inclusive excellence at the university at Buffalo. Um, what does that look like to a, on a day-to-day basis? And I'm, I'm curious how it's been informed by your study, your research, and, and I guess even to some extent, the experience with, with Architect Barbie. Hmm. Well, these days, uh, lots and lots of Zoom meetings. Um, <laughs> right. Looking beyond that, um, you know, I, I would say that my work has been influenced in, in actually a number of ways by uh, the experience of being an advocate for diversity in architecture. And um, so, for example, um, you know, what we teach, how we teach, who teaches, um, all, all those go to the heart of creating an inclusive pedagogy. Uh, diversifying the faculty of a university requires really a multi-dimensional approach, including building pipelines that start as early as possible, creating supportive and you know welcoming cultures in the academy um, so that you not only hire diverse faculty, but also retain them. And that requires thinking about mentorship and opportunities for advancement and, and day-to-day interactions. And Um, Deborah Burke has talked about the death of a thousand cuts that women face in architecture and that causes many to leave, you know, not one big disappointment, but rather just the daily, the daily, you know, cuts that eventually wear you down. So I think about, you know, how you support advocates for change so that their careers aren't penalized because of their dedication and service to helping others. I think about, you know, how to get allies on board so that the work doesn't, you know, fall on the shoulders of of a few. I also think about space and the role it plays in uh, fostering community. So there, you know, there, there are many things that have, you know, that I've taken from that work in architecture and and now I'm I'm thinking about across disciplines. Yeah, it almost seems like architecture, and I'm sure you would agree with this, but it almost seems like architecture is the perfect um, setting to kind of think about all of that because it is such a spatially organized way of thinking about things and and so much of our world is impacted that way. So um, obviously it's it's suited you well and and set you up for this important job. Um, I'm curious, what's next? Um, Are you researching anything, any new publications in the works? Where are you headed with your study of, of, of these dynamics? And, um, you know, or w- what can we expect to see from you next? Well, actually, I have a new book uh, coming out very soon. Uh, it's called Hitler's Northern Utopia, Building the New Order in Occupied Norway. Uh, so it actually looks at, um, it takes a deeper dive into ideology and everyday spaces um, as a whole. Um, Norway is not um, as well known, I think. Uh, the occupation of Norway during World War II is not as, as well known to mm-hmm. many people. Um, and definitely not the kind of massive building campaign that that happened there in that period. So from 1940 to 1945, uh, German occupiers transformed Norway, and I mean from top to bottom, into this just vast construction uh, zone. And so the book explores the Nazis' architectural and their infrastructural schemes for Norway and uh, what what they were planning for Norway and also what they tell us about the world that Hitler envisioned uh, would take shape in the wake 
of his anticipated uh, victory. And if, uh, if you've watched the Amazon um, television series, The Man in the High Castle, it's really an interesting show because it presents this alternate reality in which the Nazis have won the war and we see what the world looks like 20 years later in the 1960s you know, when you know, much of the world is under Nazi rule. Well, if you look to Norway, um, you realize that the Nazis had already actually begun to build that future. Um, it's, so it's not exactly an alternate um, reality. Um, and, uh, and by looking at Norway, we can you know, see what they intended, how they intended to physically shape their empire and hold it together. Fascinating. So when is that coming out? We need, we'll have to get you back. And dive into that one. When when can people um, order that, or I guess they could pre-order that now? Where can they get it? It comes out in a few weeks, so it's uh, soon, very soon. And the best place to reach that, or or to find out more about you, I guess that is Amazon or your local bookseller. Um, and what's the title of that? People should know that too. Yeah, Hitler's Northern Utopia. Hitler's Northern building, Utopia. Yeah, building the new order in occupied Norway. Um, and it's uh, published by Princeton. University Press could look on their website and uh, lots of pictures. Um, it's uh, one of the interesting things about writing that book and why I ended up writing the book is that there's this vast archive of um, Hitler's engineering division, the Orga Organisation Tot, um, that built a lot of these projects in Norway. And it's so large and it was left in such a mess intentionally by the Nazis when they left. They really, you know, tried to, to mess up the files as much as possible um, that it took until 2011 for the National Archives of Norway to catalog this massive collection. So it's an opportunity. I mean, it's, uh, you would think, well, you know, what else do we have to learn about World War II? But uh, new material is always coming to light. And for me, it was, uh, it was especially interesting because I mentioned, as I mentioned, a lot of it has to do with the Nazis are moving away already. You can see them moving away from this focus on just monumental architecture. You know, what we associate with Albert Speer, for example, and the Nuremberg Rally Grounds or the new Rice Chancellery in Berlin. They're actually moving away from that um, in Norway to think more about everyday spaces and how you embed uh, a political ideology in just everyday spaces in, in a space in the in the size and the curve of a street and in, in a building facade and and to me that is actually it's much more subtle and it is ter it is more terrifying um, because uh, you realize that they're they're starting to become much more subtle in how they approach um, their uh, their approach to ideology and it's you know it's uh, the way that they're going to bring people into their ideas about, you know, Aryan power. So it was actually quite terrifying to, to research. Yeah. I was going to say before you even said it, it was like that, that is more terrifying because at least with a, with a parade ground, you know, it's terrifying and it's very clear. Um, <laughs> when it's a, a subtle, um, approach to fascism, that's even scarier. Um, so, well, this has been fantastic and so interesting, and and I would love to get you back on. I, I try and read all the books of any authors that we have on, so I'll have to I'll have to take a look at that one um, before we get you back on once it's released. Um, it sounds like a, a fascinating study. And uh, before we go, your favorite historic place or site? Normally, the most difficult question we ask. Yeah, that is actually a really tough one. Um, can I pick an entire city? Of course. Okay. Well, in that case, um, I would say Berlin. Berlin is the place that I am drawn to again and again. Um, and it's not the most beautiful of cities in the way that, you know, people gush over Paris, but the layers of history there never cease to um, amaze me, even though, you know, some of those layers are infused with, with great pain and even uh, horror. Um, but there's something about walking the streets of Berlin and seeing the markings of history embedded everywhere that, that makes me just want to keep going back. Um, it's also constantly changing. Um, there's like no point being nostalgic in Berlin because um, hmm. as the architectural critic Carl Scheffler wrote in 1910, um, 
it is a city condemned forever to become and never to be. And um, I find that to be true. And it's one of the reasons I love it. Well, that is a, a, a great answer and a fitting end to the conversation. Um, Despina, it's been so much fun talking to you and so, so illuminating to have this conversation and uh, look forward to talking to you again in the future. Thanks so much. Oh, Nick, thanks so much. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to PreserveCast. To dig deeper into this episode's show, notes, and all previous episodes, visit PreserveCast.org. You can also find us online at Facebook and Twitter at PreserveCast. This program was supported by the Historic Preservation Education Foundation. PreserveCast is produced by Preservation Maryland in Baltimore City. Thanks again for your support, and remember to keep preserving.